I'm bringing you a very special extra episode of the Writer's Gym podcast between series ahead of an event at Riverside Studios next Tuesday, where I'm sharing the platform with two other authors, Nigel Planer and Simon Rumley. Nigel Planer and Friends comes to Riverside Studios on the 30th of January at 7pm. Nigel is an acclaimed poet, author, actor. He is here with me to talk about all things writing and author. We do divert into the trousers of time from Terry Pratchett. I'm very embarrassed I said lavender instead of lilac for Nightwatch, and Nightwatch was the production that changed my life, as you'll find out. And we go pretty much everywhere else as well. I hope you enjoy it, and I look forward to seeing you at Riverside Studios on Tuesday, the 30th of January. Nigel, hello. Hello. (laughs) Was writing your first love, or was performing? Um, They've existed uh, alongside each other all along, performing as long as I can remember. I used to force my younger brother to be in plays that I wrote and starred in, and he played all the baddies and the witches or any anybody who got a kicking. <laughs> my poor younger brother played, and I'd put them on outside in the garden or anywhere I could, really. So they, they always went hand in hand, and at school, I wasn't in the school plays. I think there was a group of us putting on too many uh, shows and plays and things because we wrote our own comedy satire of the school, very critical of the school. Maybe that's why they didn't put us in the school play. So they've always gone hand in hand, and I've always had a sort of dual stream to to my life. That's pretty much what happened with me as well. Performing and writing came along together. I was a member of a youth theatre, and that was mm-hmm. very much how things started for me. And from a coaching which, point... Mm. Which one do you find uh, actually earns you a living, though, if, if, if either... It's always a little bit of if either. Writing was what I truly loved. What happened with me was youth theatre was very shiny and interesting and it was my social life and some of my job opportunities, directing, things like that came through that. And it was a case of, I want to be a writer. Ooh, look, shiny. And suddenly it's 20 years later (laughs) nearly. And I'd, I'd been involved with theatre companies and I'd done things like that but what I really loved was writing so in the end what happened was at my local theatre the last show I ever directed before I left to finish my PhD was Improbable Fiction by Ellen Akebourne which is all about a writing group getting together to tell each other why they've done absolutely no writing having a cup of tea and leaving yeah. and I that was me. That. I don't know that Akebourne I love Akebourne plays I don't know that one it's absolutely my favourite one. The second half, you're you're in the non-naturalistic sphere. You you walk in at the very end of Act One. Something happens involving a storm, and suddenly the protagonist is in all the fantasy worlds of these other writers that we've been uh, learning yeah. about in Act One. And right, right. You you move through genres. You're in science fiction. You're in historical fiction. Sounds you're like in the, yeah. there was a, a play by Peter Ustinov called The Love of Four Colonels. They have four different uh, colonels who have a chance not to go to hell, uh, and they're allowed to enact a sort of spoof of a drama of their own, and they're each a different nationality. There's a German one and a Russian one and an English one and a French one, and they do the little scenario. So the Russian one is a spoof of a Chekhov play, and the devil, played by Peter Ustinov, no doubt, enters each one to try and trip them up and get them to go to hell. I remember it as being good fun. I don't, I don't know if I'd enjoy it nowadays, um, but it gave Peter Ustinov the chance to put on all of these mm. different accents because he was fluent in all these languages and accents. Uh, I can remember the Russian one. There's a girl on the swing and saying, oh, Moscow, when we get to Moscow sort of thing. They, they made me laugh when I was young. Anyway, it sounds a similar sort of thing. You enter four yeah. different fantasies. The person who's playing the devil will enter and try and use her. Mm what the romantic fantasy is. Hearing you say that makes me realise that Twisted Branches, in a way, had more in common with with what I'd been directing prior to that than I, than I ever realised, because the whole point for me of a short story cycle, the same house, different generations, was everybody seeing the same story from their own point of view. And somebody's mm-hmm. mental state means that this is a tragedy, 
but standing somewhere else, you see it a completely different way. What I've done is a series of short stories which can exist entirely on their own, but gradually give an overall picture of a family in one house over five generations. And depending on whose head you're in at the time, a different person is the bad guy. More specifically, so girl. Five, five generations take us back to how long ago? Please don't make me do maths. I will panic and not do it. No, but I mean, is it, are you talking 100 <laughs> I, years it ago was, or 500 no, years ago? No, the earliest one in here, oh, it would have been 1970. Oh, right, and right. that's and that's the tail end of the oldest generation. It's, and do you I've, go into the future as well? No, I stopped on New Year's Day of 2023. So what do you reckon, I've always wondered about this, what do you reckon a generation is? Mm. It's not 100 years, this is a generation. Is it 10 years? Is it 20 years? Is it, what's a generation? I suppose it's 25 years because that's when you could go from being a child to having children yourself. So that's a generation, is it? What do you reckon? I wouldn't find a definition. I would say the different experiences I've had about what generation really means tends to be very, very cultural. You feel like you are with somebody in a generation when, you know, if, if you if you think about something like the Beatles versus Wings or what, what, you know, Paul McCartney was the frog song to some people, whereas when Twist and Shout first arrived and it was the most sort of overtly sexual movement they'd seen on stage. Like the, Be the Beatles were so many things that depending on where you turn up, I didn't even understand that at first and I was a Beatles fan. So it depends on where you show up. So for me, the way I'm defining generation, or I guess the way I'm interested in generations is we inherit beliefs quite often accidentally from our adults and we get a certain idea of what's important in the world through that. Like, I mean, I, I remember waking up at something like eight years old, walking into the living room where my mum was watching the Rocky Horror Show and she was so attached to the Rocky Horror Show that she couldn't bear to turn it off. The Rocky Horror Show became very important to me of itself, but probably also because I felt like it was a kind of rite of passage might sound wrong in context, but it made me feel like I'd been inducted into something. And The Young Ones was actually another one. I remember my older cousins watching it and feeling terribly grown up because I could then watch it with them. So mm -hmm. that that for me, those those are memories for me. Whereas if you ask somebody about those same things, their experience into it with peers might be different. Um, I've, I've always had hmm. uh, a, a situation because uh, – I've had big generational differences in, in my marriages. I, I've Snap. been married to someone much younger than me, and I've married to someone older than me. And so I had stepchildren and a, 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 a grandchild even when I was under 30. Mm. Um, and so these generational things were, were all muddled up for me. Mm. I remember finding that my stepchildren were into the doors and thinking how weird because i remember when the doors came out and the, and hendrix and things like that and the generations find other stuff don't they and and mm. recycle it and it means something new to them maybe as you say yes but i've always liked that feeling when you've got grandparents great grandparents yeah. grandchildren that all of the generations together because there's much more that they share mm. than that differentiate them we we go on about generation z and generation x and where are we at the moment who who are the i lose track of that i'm generation i don't know what generation i'm 70 years old i don't know what generation am i a baby boomer i think um, so right but you well, see a lot cup. of my friends are you know, much older than me. And a lot of my friends are younger than me, not much younger than me, because mm. uh, my kids are I, I, it's strange. I've got grandkids who are the same age as my kids. So I find generational mix really nice when they're all mixed up. It is nice. I mean, I, I have a partner who's 20 years older than me, and I grew up in a theatre oh, where right, all so... of my friends... Yeah, absolutely. I... I um. 
I've always been in a situation where having friendships of different ages was the norm. And I, I found that much more natural mm. than being at school where it was weird if you were friends with people in the year above or below. I yeah, was exactly, exactly. Stupid, so isn't it's it? odd that we both seem to have mm. uh, 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 written books that are trying to somehow grasp hold of that because uh, in my book, it's in the same house. Jeremiah Bourne is... is um, he lives in a house in Blackfriars Road and finds himself transported to 1910, but in the house. The time travel is not time and space in my book. Mm. And uh, there are scenes set in the future in 100 years from now mm. in that same house where there's uh, people in the future are no wiser than us. They're having annoying residence association meetings. And... Um, there are gradual reveals for him to understand. His job is to try and understand why he's got this ability to travel. He's inherited it. It's about inherited memory, as you were saying. Inherited memory, like, I don't know, did you see that? There was a thing going around on, on Twitter, the beaver. It was a, a, no. Somebody brought up a little beaver in a flat. It had never seen another beaver, never seen a river, never seen a tree. It had been brought up as a baby, and as soon as it could walk, the first thing it did was build a dam in the flat between two of the rooms along, and Gosh. it dragged a waste paper bin and a cushion and some kids' toys and, and built a functioning dam. Now, mm. how, did it, how did it know to how do that? How did it how, know? How do birds know how to build a nest? Their first nest is as mm. good as their last nest. They don't, need, they don't need to go to nest school to make a nest. So... Mm. My my sort of time travel premise is that we we are inheriting more than we realise. There's a writer called Rupert Sheldrake who coined the phrase morphic resonance mm. to explain why things are the way they are. They're like a sort of mime, a mimetic repetition of what went before, and that's what we're gradually inheriting uh, memories and I just got excited by those concepts and thought, what if in the future the memory became controllable, a controllable thing, mm. and you could, and that is a bit of a leap of faith to imagine. Yes, you can, you can travel in time using inherited memory, and you can remember things that didn't happen to you, maybe. Mm. And so, it, yeah, I'm, at that point, I'm obviously completely out to lunch. The book is. It's it's sort of a bit genreless. It's like a, it's historical. It's sci-fi. It's mystery, comedy, futuristic time travel adventure romp. Uh, with, with I mean, I, I'm not very good at all the categories of the you know the the yeah. genre categories. So I put them all in. But also with a very Douglas Adams style narration that there there is that voice that yeah. is the sort of sense of humour of the universe that comes into it. That's right. There's a sort mm. of cynical or, or, or sceptical sense of humour, like uh, uh, Terry Pratchett as well. I, yes. I read the audiobooks. I mean, mm. I'm, I'm the voice of uh, the unabridged audiobooks of many uh, Terry Pratchett books. I had, so I had a big sort of imprint uh, of, from Terry Pratchett and, the, and that. Mm. What do you call it? That was quite good, the, the humour of the universe or something. <laughs> But it's that's, the, that's sort of the, the universe's finger, sense yeah. of humour for me is yeah. why I love Douglas Adams as much as I do, and it is absolutely the same with with Pratchett. I don't know if you could actually see; yeah. you probably can't from here. There's death and rinse window on top of the bookcase over there, and and that's no, one of one of my influences as well. But just coming back to what yeah. you said about memory, yeah. that does chime for me greatly because both in these stories and and for me growing up the the liberal Jewish tradition is not these stories definitely happened in terms of the Bible. If they happened, great, lovely. But the point of the stories was always, what do they say about you? What do they mean about you? And when you take something like like Discworld or, or Truckers, the Gnome series, it is absolute psychological reality. There is so much wisdom in it. It is more our world than our world, which is what fantasy can do. And although mine is not fantasy, it's still speaking in that that storytelling tradition that as you gradually put your jigsaw together of everybody's slightly warped perspectives, the way everybody's sort of looking at each other, but really seeing their own hang-ups, insecurities, what's going on for them. And for me, that that's that's fascinating. That's why I wrote a book mm. using memory rather as my chronology, that it does jump all over the place. If you read the stories chronologically, 
you you'd miss without spoiling this to high heaven, but you'd miss the comedy, you'd miss the tragedy, you'd miss the storylines that were going on in individuals' heads, the things that join up for them. And so I used memory like that. And in my sort of commentary on on us working together, I, I was saying, you know, you, you're doing with time what I'm doing with memory. But really, that is the human experience that we we don't live chronologically. Every time we have a conversation, we've got a memory of something that happened 20 years ago or an association with this. We don't just live in a straight line. So one, one of my favorite novelists, Maggie O'Farrell, when mm-hmm. she was asked about why she doesn't write or doesn't publish novels that are chronological, why you move about in time. She said, because that's actually more natural, because that is how we live. We 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 don't just start here and move forward. We're engaged It's also in- very um very unreliable. I, I recently had mm. during well recently during the lockdown, uh because uh, I'm struggling trying to write a memoir at the moment. And I, I had uh, we booked me and Peter, my ex double act partner, we booked four hour and a half, two hour conversations uh, during the lockdown. And we thought we'll we'll go through this and see what we can remember because we worked together since 1975, four. And our memories of the same events are completely different, not not just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. He has recorded in in his memory, of course, he's wrong and I'm right. Of course. Mine is 100% accurate, um, and he's, I don't know what he is thinking, he's invented it all. But there are there are events which to me were pivotal uh, that he has no recollection of at all. And even when I reminded him of it, he, he, it, 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 he, he had no recollection. And then there are events which I'd kind of, which weren't very important to me, this a spoof band we made, not bad news. It was another band, a uh, nice weather. I'd, I, that was like, yeah, we did that, and it was a gig we did, and it's forgotten. But for him, that's what his his memory has hung on to that event. That's when he was happy doing that nice weather. It was a band called Nice Weather, it was a hippie band, and we did we did a spoof of it, and he's hung on to that for uh, how long ago is it? For, you know, forty five years. Mm-hmm. That's that's his that's his memory my memory is that you know he he walked out he he was rude to the boss of that gig and and walked out and i'm fur- i was still furious with him 45 years later sort of thing so we, we have completely different memories and that fascinates me as well is that how many universes are there that you would go back to if you if, if if you were to use memory as your as your vehicle, how many places are there to go? And in true Pratchett trousers of time fashion, yeah, we, we pick the leg we go down, and the definition of human that, experience uh, we it, can't. Yeah. yeah, is that? A, I've not heard that one. But trouser of time. Where is that? Um, Which, I will. You know, I will find it. I will put yeah. that in the show notes and I will find it, which is a very, I very confident that. way of saying I can't remember where to yeah, find it. Yeah, do it. A tr- and, and tell me again, that's good. The, the, the in, trousers of time. The trousers of time and you, you choose which leg okay. you go down. I will just say about Pratchett that he was instrumental in my life changing because I lost a friend to cancer when I was 25 and we'd been in youth theatre together and we'd done some Pratchett plays together. I formed a theatre company to do a production of Night Watch for Macmillan Cancer Support to raise money for Macmillan Cancer Support in memory of Sophie. And that was when I got out of my terribly sensible, soul-destroying job at the... I I won't name the newspaper in question, but I was about to say its nickname and I won't. Um, And that was when I came back to teaching Lambda exams, directing shows, found my way back to writing, writing. And that was very, very important to me. But with with Pratchett and with particularly Night Watch, where it's all about wearing the um, lavender in memory of the fallen, and they they do go back and they do go back and check their memories. And of course, things are not as they appeared, and there is a who done it within that. But fundamentally, what I think he's and it, is that book called Night Watch. No. Night Watch, yes. I don't think I know that. Is it it's, Grimes? It's, is it is it Grimes? Yeah, uh, Sam Vimes. Some Sometimes. Vimes, not Grimes, Vimes, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's them. It's some. Um... It's not the one with the dragons. The lady with the dragons. She she is slightly off stage because she's giving birth at this point. Oh right, no. And I she's don't. she's no, in the one. shadows of this story. It happens and it's to him not... while. Guards, guards, guards. It's it's after guards, guards. Wow, right. I haven't had this this knowledge tested for a long time. Yeah, uh, there yeah. was a time when I would know all of the answers to these. I I can. Right. So I you're can, a which you're a they're on. nerd. He changed my life. I'm also friends with Rihanna, so that's another thing. Oh, right. So am I. So am I. Yeah. I've never actually yeah. met her. Um, really... Only we're we're friends online. Yeah. Oh, because like, I read been, it, her book. She's been very supportive, no, and and I'm um, likewise her fun book about witches mm. at the moment. That's, yeah. That's, she that's, she actually gave me two of the octopuses that are in gold over there. It was my my birthday the other day. Those are from Rihanna. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, what were the questions I was actually asking you? Right now, where were we? Yeah. We. Well, we have we're not there, but I'm just going to go there anyway. Given that our Nigel Planer and Friends event is at the newly regenerated Riverside Studios next Tuesday. Yes, absolutely. Tuesday the thirtieth of January. When you say next Tuesday, we yes. don't know when this is going out. So Tuesday the thirtieth of January at seven o'clock, lasting yes. an hour and a half. Yes. Down by eight thirty, whereupon we will sign books. Absolutely. Um, and and sell them to you. All Absolutely, books. books and books by not books by. Well, not all books. Um, no, other no. other people might find these that rather difficult. That's my. That, these kind of books. Oh, yeah. Yes, these kind of books. We both these kind of those. books. I've also got a poetry book out at the moment, making other plans. My sort of collected works as a, as a mm. poet. So I'll Which... bring a few of those along if anybody's interested. And and uh, yeah. I've just been on tour, mm. doing poetry readings with Henry Normal. And then readings from Jeremiah Bourne. So that's what I'm sort of on at the moment. But sorry, I interrupted you. Absolutely. To give a plug to our, to, our, to our gig. That is exactly how I like to be interrupted. That's more than fine. We are all in very much in London in what we're writing in different ways. And I found that with your with your poetry as well. I could feel where you were was... I don't want to say important because I'm not the writer. That's for you to say. But it was very much part of the emotional landscape. Felt place did feel like it was in there. And I, um, I found with Twisted Branches setting it in Richmond and it being a place near where I live, but not where I live. Um, I I did notice how without it being an intention. I keep being drawn back to certain places that were in Richmond. So I, I just embraced it for Twisted Branches, but it had already turned up in various ghost stories and other things that I'd had published that you mm. get your, you get your Wessex of your own, you get your geographical landscape. Yeah, yeah. I think. yeah. I mean, what, what's yours uh, like? <laughs> I, well, I'm South, South East London. I've been for 20 years and also I, I went to school around here, but I'm a West Londoner. And uh, Jeremiah Bourne's Blackfriars Road uh, it goes up to Bloomsbury Square, but it's basically here, south of Southwark, basically. Um, and I'm absolutely fascinated by the history in this area because it looms up at you. I mean, our Tesco's, for example, there's a, there's a Tesco's just around the corner from me with a forecourt, um, all newly built, but there's a stone in the ground there which is 300 AD with chiseled words in Latin in it, that they obviously couldn't move that. So they had to build the Tesco's round it. And that's no surprise around here. There's a history going back 2000 years all around you. And then the other sections, I did live uh, Southwest London, Hammersmith, Hammersmith Fulham. I don't have, I wrote a, a couple of novels and I had a big attachment to when I, I lived on the river in West London. In those novels, there's a presence of Hammersmith and a film script I'm trying to get off the ground at the moment, likewise. But in Jeremiah Bourne, it's the only other sort of part of London that he goes to, funnily enough, is Twickenham. And he goes there 100 years ago because I'm fascinated by what those houses, some of those big houses around by Marble Hill Park would have, um, you know, had quite middle-class couples in them with servants. There, were, there, there was a huge amount of, half the women in the country, I think, were in domestic service 100 years ago, 1910. That fascinates me. And then what it was like, one of my characters is obsessed with the 1970s. As an escape route, she flips herself back to 1973 in Twickenham. 
mm -hmm. uh, where I, I happened to be in Twickenham on a squat in 1973. And I still have a, a, a lot of strong memories of that era, of the, of the sort of the flared trousers, what you'd expect from me. Quite honestly, um, I, I do need to tell you at that point that it's it's really not just you, <laughs> Blairs. Well, but that might be my fault, you know. It kind of might, is. That might be my bad influence. It it kind of is. I wasn't going to admit that, but apparently I am now admitting that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, seventy three, particular sort of turnaround year, I, I feel, and. It, I've really enjoyed writing. There's a sequence I've written where she escapes back there and talks to a load of... She's sort of on Eel Pie Island. She meets a load of stoners, and there's quite a funny campfire scene with, uh, uh, with the stoners, which is almost... I just put myself back there. It's, mm. it's fairly accurate. I wasn't doing much inventing in that dialogue, which is totally ludicrous dialogue, but... A lot of dialogue was, it seems to me, with stoners in 1973. Of course, when you're on the inside of it, nothing is ridiculous. It depends where you're standing as a narrative voice. I well, suppose so. I suppose yeah. so. But, but you get the best of both worlds ridiculous. with narration. Um, yes, you do. And footnotes. I've enjoyed uh, uh, taking yes. a leaf out of Pratchett's uh, yes. book. I very much enjoyed... Uh, pedantic footnotes that start to sort of uh, develop their own plot lines in in jeremiah born in time they they start to take over the book really and it's a, it's an excuse to get in a lot of information as well because there's there's a lot of quite interesting bits when you're researching the history particularly um stupid things people have done bad ideas that caught on and it's quite fun to expose all that but also there's a little subplot about me and my editor uh, my editor who um who doesn't like what i'm doing and, and then they give me a new editor and i feel guilty because was it me who complained about the old editor that got rid of the old and and mm -hmm. then i get another editor and uh, there's a whole um there's a whole kind of comic subplot uh, in the footnotes, which I, I very much enjoyed doing that. When I do the second book, I'm hoping to um, increase that. Um, trouble is, footnotes go small print, don't they? Maybe my footnotes they do. should be, just start taking over the, the whole Yeah, page. you could go really meta and just have the main yeah. bit about that size and the footnotes, <laughs> three quarters of the page. Yeah, have the main bit in small print. and the foot. <laughs> uh, you've, you've, you've actually made me think more on how meaning and form work together because obviously as a memoirist you're you're gonna be thinking those things anyway that i mean my, my favorite memoir is toast by um Ni nigel slater with the um oh, I know the one where it's all yeah, recipe yeah, cards yeah yeah not important but recipe cards this is toast this is angel delight his memories going through life our recipe cards. He's a chef. Food was how he got out of the bad situations and into the and into the life of his own that he created. And it's interesting hearing you say that about the footnotes. That what really does come across with that is, or what what it seems like to me as a reader, is what was on your mind was not. Now, how can I make this most conventionally readable? I felt like there was your personality, what you were trying to say about the world. And the the humour that you had, the footnotes, the sort of influence of Pratchett, the form and the subject matter really need to find each other in in order to, I think, just be be the writer that that one is. So for me, this had to be a short story cycle because it couldn't just be a short story collection. This is about memory. This is about community. This is about how people look at each other. So the form of a cycle where they all relate to each other was absolutely part of what I was saying when writing mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. I guess it is mm -hmm. the same for you that we can't go, just to come back to where we were earlier, we can't go back up the trousers of time. We can't go and check if we're right or if, you know, our business partner is right about our, our memory. And yeah. if we yeah. could, yeah. everything would be different. So I'm wondering maybe how did the, maybe the footnotes come into that somehow, that it is maybe related to memory or how we think. Yeah, the footnotes. It, it's more. I think I have a low boredom threshold, and I don't mm. like. I, 
reading something with fresh eyes is really difficult. If you read it again and again, it's hard to see on a rewrite what what the reader will think because I I get you get sort of snow blind, mm. and footnotes are just a, a a wonderful technique of putting yourself in. Mm. So you're not pretending that you're this great person who knows it all. You're you're, you're just lost. You're putting how lost you are in at the same time, and it, it it's a diversion. But for you, and when you're writing, you think, oh, that'll be great. I'll, I'll, mm. I'll, I'll I can do that for the afternoon now, and I don't. I'll solve that tomorrow. I don't know how to solve that bit. Is that called meta? Is that what meta is? Putting yourself in. I think it's just the the number of layers of which you're commenting on, commenting on, commenting. It's it's just funny hearing it because I think for me footnotes would, in terms of my writing rather than reading, certainly with my PhD, that was the bit that bored me to tears was the formatting oh, the, and the having so to think about it. So ibid, yes, that thing when you have to put ibid because you referred to it before, but that's an academic situation, isn't it, where you have to justify mm. every quote everything you've remembered whereas the 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 joy with a with a comic footnote is you can say i think it was i think it was uh, so and so who said and then you can say but and maybe it wasn't i can't remember properly and you that's fine do you know what i just i just wonder because i have enjoyed prose writing so much more than performing and i've i've done obviously nothing like the scale of what you've done but i've i've done sketches with other people and I've done, you know, but been in various other situations. I personally, whatever this says about me, enjoy being God of the universe and getting on with it in a way that is, I find easier. Whereas it's kind of interesting that even when you're not performing, even when you are the solo writer and it is in prose, you've ended up having a conversation with yourself through footnotes. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm not the protagonist of my own life. Hmm. I feel, I feel much happier sharing even even during the day, you, you know, the morning's work, you would allow yourself to write freely. In the afternoon, you, you can use your critical eye. That's like a dialogue with yourself. Di- I mean, I think all, all of it's dialogue uh, mm. in, in my mind. It's all movable. The, the mm. text is fluid. You're, everything's movable, and it's all about a dialogue. I always start with dialogue. I feel uncomfortable if it's – I don't mean dialogue, actual quoted dialogue. I mean a dialogue mm. in, in your head. Mm. Um, life is a dialogue. There's always other possibilities. And I, I, that that sort of, I think, Lee um, – I mean, it's a commercial suicide maybe because Lee Childs is the opposite of that. He does almost like a computer game story. The protagonist is at the centre. Everything flows out from his mm. experience – he will kill anyone who gets in his way, and we're going through to the end, and it's a, a linear story, and uh, that sells, I think. But mm. I, 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 you know, I even if I tried, I don't think I could manage to do that. I think I would get too bored and too comical. Mm. You know, I, the, as you said, the the comedy of the universe is. Or what did you say? It was a good phrase. I'll, I'll have to play it back to find out what I actually said. Yeah, but what yeah. I, what I roughly said, yeah. what, do you know, I, I will play it back because I, I can't find it exactly, but it was the sense of humour of the universe. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I and find that, with Pratchett that, or Adams or, or yours. Absolutely. And that keeps interfering. If you try and write, if I, if you or I were to try and write a Lee Childs book. That, We'd fall that asleep. That goes from A to B <laughs> to C. No, the, you'd start getting the comic stuff of the universe mm. comes in and messes yeah. it up yeah. because... I just like to take the piss, really. <laughs> just to say that that gorgeous image of of dialogue and the argument with self—that's exactly how I write as well. It always begins as an argument, it begin, or or a discussion. It, it becomes characters finding each other through talking to each other and finding their differences in yeah, the same. Yeah. And in terms of the writers' gym podcast, I think we should dare our listeners to have a go at that if they haven't already, because it's a lovely I'm way sure in. Sure, they all have. Yes. Yeah. Okie doke. Well, okay. love to speak to you and see you next Tuesday, the 30th of January at, well, it starts at seven. We're going to get there. Yeah, we'll, we'll be there earlier, but yeah, yeah. Ha- see see all of you out there at 7pm okay. on yeah. Tuesday, the 30th at Riverside Studios. Bye-bye. Cheers. <laughs>